Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. The Houston Midtown Chapter of the Society for Financial Awareness presents Money Matters with your host, Christopher Hensley. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m. Got a great show lined up for you today. We have discussed the impact of emotions on money in the past, uh, but this is an important topic that we will revisit from time to time. Uh, we have with us today Martin Holbolt, who has done a TED Talk on just that topic, how to overcome the cost of being human. Uh, where does emotion play a role in financial decisions. So please stay tuned. Uh, keep listening. If you are a longtime listener, you know that we always reserve just the first few moments of the show uh, to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston and the Gulf Coast region when it comes to financial literacy. Uh, so boy, we are uh, already in January 2020 is on uh, already kicked off and started and you hear me each and every week talk about Houston Money Week 2020 uh, which will take place in April but as I always say uh, we get started uh, back in 2019 the last quarter to plan for 2020 uh, because it's one of these things that as we get going it gets ramped up and ramped up and before we know it it's here um, and it's such a, a big event that we we have so many different things that are, are connected to it where we've have Houston Money Week's footprint um, in many different organizations so just wanted to take a few moments to talk about uh, some of the events that are coming up through that the, the main one uh, is going to be February 8th um, at 9.30 a.m. to 1. Uh, this is the Houston Hispanic Forum Career and Education Day. So um, that event by itself is through Houston Hispanic Forum. Uh, it is a gigantic event. When I say gigantic, this is, I want to say, the third or fourth year that we've partnered with them uh, to do free workshops and educational events during career and educational day. But if you're here in Houston or the Gulf Coast region and you know the George R. Brown Convention Center, this is a giant convention center that takes up uh, from one city block to the next city block. Uh, huge. And the Houston Hispanic Career and Education Days takes up about half of that facility each and every year when they kick this event off. Uh, it is a really, really good event if you have any, I uh, want to say high school age kids, but they, there are even uh, events for middle school, so that's not too early to start thinking about it. Uh, from one of the talks that I'm going to do on that day is college planning, and so it's going to be more, mostly geared towards the parents, uh, alternatives to uh, funding college yourself, scholarships, financial aid, things that you need to get on your radar if you haven't already done that and you're trying to put a kid through school, uh, what can you do to best prepare yourself for that? So that's one of the talks. We're also going to be joined by uh, Win Fung uh, Bruchet, who is a, also on the leadership team with Houston Money Week. And she, I want to say, last three or four years has also been doing talks with us there, and they are great. They are actually geared towards the students. Uh, so it, it will be um, time well spent. Now, the event as a whole, uh, we've got these breakout groups like we're doing where we're doing the um, workshops and uh, seminars for the either the parents or the students. But there are also panels, career panels, where they're getting to interview uh, STEM um, 
you know, people who work for the FBI, people who work for the oil industry and the energy industry, uh, the police department, uh, many, many different either technical or uh, uh, positions out there where they actually kind of get to do a day in the life. They get to interview these people themselves and ask them the questions if it's the career that they're thinking about getting into so they can explore that. Uh, very, very cool event. Um, I don't know who they're having as the main speaker this year, but the mayor had kicked it off several years ago, and they have kind of a rally right at the beginning. Not just Houston, even. Uh, they have buses that will bus people from outside of the Houston area to it, so it is a giant uh, event. Encourage people to go to that. You can find out more, Houston Hispanic uh, Forum. Uh, dot org or go to the Houston Money Week website HoustonMoneyWeek dot org and we have a calendar link for for upcoming events. Uh, one more event before we get Martin on the phone here. Uh, we are smack dab in the middle, uh, or not middle. I'm sorry, we're just kicking off uh, the winter uh, fun drive for here at KPFT. That's going to ta- that is taking place from January 23rd to February 12th. We are community-based radio, so one of the ways that we bring this to you free at no charge and we are able to keep the lights on is through community uh, fund rate or through through volunteers supported and through community giving back and and making donations. So if you would like to make a donation to the station, you can always go to kpft.org. Uh, there is a tip jar there. That's one way that you can do it. Uh, you, there's many different ways to contribute and give to the station if that's something that you want to do. We always make an effort uh, during this winter drive so that we don't have to do this all year long. Uh, but we're right here at the beginning beginning of the year uh with that let's go ahead and get martin on the line martin are you there i am here well thank you so much for joining the show this morning it's my pleasure happy to be here absolutely so one of the things um i like to usually start off by uh by introducing you and reading your bio but i thought what what could you tell us about yourself so listeners can get to know you because i know you're doing quite a few different things um what can you tell us about yourself Boy, well, you know, here's something a little bit unique. Uh, I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, son of a Scottish native and an American uh, Air Force man back in the 60s. Wow, okay, not and everybody can say that. <laughs> not, not a lot of people, no. And then we moved to Germany, and I came to the U.S. when I was three, lived in about five different states for 10 years. At age 13, we went back to Scotland for, I think it was about four months, where I started eighth grade. Then I finished eighth grade and did ninth grade in Seoul, South Korea, and then did 10th through 12th grade in London Central High School in England. That's kind of unique. Yeah, absolutely. That's more traveling than most people do over their lifetime. <laughs> so that happened yeah. in a short frame of time there. Well, that's that's fantastic. Now, you also, uh, besides doing the, the TED Talk, you've got your own RIA as well. What uh, What is the name of your company? My company is called TM Wealth Management, LLC. So tell us a little bit about that. I've watched the TED Talk, and and it's how to overcome the cost of being human. Uh, Tell us what – well, let's tell us about that. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, let me go back to early in my career. I think it's a good story that illustrates this. So I left university with my my piece of paper, my degree. I was ready to to conquer the world. I was well-trained in – economic theory and business theory and personal finances. And about a year into my career, my mother, who lives in California, and I I live in Utah, she sent me a newspaper article. Now, Chris, for the younger listeners, this is back when you sent the actual piece of paper and not a link to it online, because there was no online back then. Remember those days? I do clippings, yes. (laughs) Yes, clippings. But this, this article really changed my outlook on my career. The article said that over 80% of professional athletes will declare bankruptcy within five years of leaving their sport. It's almost kind of common knowledge now, but it wasn't back then. And when I read that, it just blew me away, Chris, and here's why. That went against everything I learned at university. You see, and I think you know this because you've studied economic theory, but modern economic theory is based upon a fallacy is based upon the idea that you and I and everyone else listening out there that we never make a mistake when it comes to managing our money. 
And if we want to, you know, impress the uh, the public, we say things like we make utility maximizing decisions. What that means basically is, again, according to modern economic theory, everyone always makes the best choice possible for themselves. I have to ask you a personal question, Chris. Have you ever made a mistake with your money? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So not, not just a yeah. It's oh, yeah. We all do, right? That's right. And so I read, this, I read this article that really seems to contradict everything I was trained at at university, which reminds me of a good quote by John Wooden. John Wooden said, it's what you learn after you know it all that really counts. I love that. Isn't that great? So you, you get the degree out of the way so you can start really learning stuff. And so, again, it contradicts everything I learned at, uh, in economic theory. So I began to look for the real solutions and the real answers, and I came across the field of behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. Now, these fields are closely related, but what they assume is that investors, you and I, the public, that we're not always logical when it comes to managing our money. And so when I learned that, it's like the heavens opened up and said, Martin, this is your life's mission. And that became my, my life's work, my passion. I read, read every book I can get my hands on. Actually, this morning I'm in Las Vegas on vacation on my way to California, and I have a book about behavioral economics. I can't put it down. It drives my wife crazy. <laughs> nice. You, you know what I'm talking about, right, Chris? Yeah, you, we, we love what we do for a living, you and I. And so I, I read all these books. I, I read, read, wrote a few books. I did my TEDx talk. And I believe for you and for the listeners, I can summarize my entire life's work in just seven key words. So if you learn nothing else today from this, this interview, write these words down. Emotions can be hazardous to your wealth. That's my 20-year career in just seven key words. Emotions can be hazardous to your wealth. Now, I want to clarify, it's not that emotions are bad, that they are what they are. The challenge comes when we don't recognize the influence emotions have on our decision-making process, especially when it comes to money. And this leads to what I call financial misbehavior. So financial misbehavior is when very smart, hardworking, successful people use gut feeling, intuition, and emotions instead of logic to make important financial choices. And this usually will end up with that. Well, you'll end up with lower investment returns, maybe unnecessary or out of control spending. Financial misbehavior introduces financial stress into our lives, which can impact our health, our relationships, uh, even our spirituality, our mental well-being. Really, everything's impacted by how well we do or don't manage our money. I've also learned that this condition of financial misbehavior is not just for the poor people. It affects doctors, it, lawyers, uh, business people. Very smart, successful people can be just as guilty of financial misbehavior. So I think in order to understand how this financial misbehavior kind of develops uh, and appears in our lives, we need to do a brief summary of how our brains operate. I think we all know that our brains have two basic parts, the emotional side and the logical side. And that is an oversimplification for all you neuroscientists out there listening. I, I understand that, but it works for today. So the emotional side wants two things, Chris. Any guesses what drives the emotions in our, in our mind? Uh, no, tell me. <laughs> I'll just tell you. All right. I'm the guester today. Emotions want to either get pleasure or avoid pain. Ah. So it's kind of, kind of very short-term thinking. Right? I want to either get pleasure now or avoid pain right now. And that's the, the primary driving factor for the emotional side. The logical side wants to take its time. It wants to carefully compare and contrast all possible courses of action and choose the absolute best one. Now, you know, left to its own, the logical side may never make a decision because we can always just keep getting more and more information, right? Life is good when the emotional side and the logical side are both working together. But there's a couple of challenges with that. Uh, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics, and he said, as much as possible, our brains will push choices into the emotional side. It's faster, it's easier, and it uses less energy. And, of course, the emotional side is also very powerful because since the beginning of mankind, we kind of use that to survive. Let's now go into neuroscience here a little bit, and they've given us some really fascinating insights how our brains operate. They've taken pictures of our brains while we're thinking. In one study, they looked at the brain scans of people who were thinking about getting money. 
And what they found is the dopamine levels went up, right? The feel-good parts of the regions were all triggered, and, and they felt awesome. So what that means is we don't have to actually get the money to feel good. Just thinking about getting the money feels good. Wow. It's, it's kind of like window shopping, right? People window shop because it's fun. They enjoy it. They like just thinking about getting that stuff. Now, I don't know about you, Chris, but sometimes I think about buying something, like a new set of, head, set of headphones. I love headphones and speakers. I'm a, I'm a music guy. And just thinking about and doing the research, I really enjoy that. Then I actually get it. And some, sometimes it's not quite as good as I thought it was going to be. Like the, the actual satisfaction you get from owning stuff sometimes isn't as good as thinking about owning the stuff. That's been proven by neuroscientists. They did one study where they compared the brain scans of people thinking about money to cocaine users who are currently high. And what they found is they couldn't tell them apart. So, in other words, the brain scan of a cocaine user while they're high looks a lot like a brain scan of someone thinking about money. Now, do you think that's a good way to make financial decisions when you're acting like a cocaine addict who's high? Does not sound like it. <laughs> not a good place to start, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably, probably not a good place to start. That's right. In fact, I think that may explain why even I once, actually, I think now twice in my life, I've bought a lottery ticket. I wasn't thinking straight. You know, I was thinking about the money, and it felt good. And I remember buying this lottery ticket about 26 years ago for $1. I brought it home. My wife and I, we closed our eyes, and then we just thought about what it would be like to have all that money. Oh, boy. And it, it still feels good right now, Chris, to think about it. Even though the odds of winning the lottery are, you know, you, you, you watch my TEDx talk, the odds of winning the lottery are about the same as being hit by lightning, bitten by a shark, hit by a meteorite, and getting a hole in one all on the same day. <laughs> that ever happened to you, Chris? No, no, not, yeah. not, not, not one, not all. <laughs> not one, not all, okay? So, so we have this kind of feel-good part of the brain, which certainly drives us and can influence our decisions. The opposite of feeling good, though, is fear, and fear might be the most dangerous emotion when it comes to managing money because fear triggers the amygdala part of the brain, which literally bypasses rational thought. If we're face-to-face with a wild animal, that's fine, right? You don't want to overanalyze that. You want to just get out of there. You want to fight, okay, fight or flight. That's fine. But what if that fear is triggered by a downswing in the stock market? Maybe your portfolio is now down 25%. Fear kicks in. And it makes you want to do something when the best course of action might be doing nothing, right? Just holding on to it and letting it recover. Now, one of my clients is named Dave. Of course, not his real name, right? We'll we'll just call him Dave. This guy has a PhD, so he's very, very smart. He earns a high income, very successful business person. When we met in 2017, he revealed to me, I might even say confessed to me, that in the summer of 2009, which was the very bottom of a stock market correction, But that summer of 2009, he moved $500,000 from stock mutual funds into a bank account. And the money sat there ever since. Now, because your listeners, I'm sure, are are maybe a little more well-versed, financially speaking, than most, thanks to your good work, they probably understand that in 2009 at the bottom of the market, that was probably the worst possible time to sell your stock mutual funds, wasn't it? In fact, back then, the Dow Jones was at about 6000 Now we're playing with twenty eight, twenty nine thousand. 29000 Had this smart, hardworking gentleman kept his money where it was in the stock market, he'd probably have now $1.5 to $2 million in his retirement nest egg. So here, a, a fear-based reaction cost this person literally about $1 to $1.5 million wow. of lost opportunity. That's huge, so, Martin. Yeah, this, Martin. I'm gonna. You, yeah. We've we've talked about a lot, and I just want to kind of digest some of this, and then we'll 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 come back to this because mm-hmm. uh, we're at fear. We're talking about fear based decisions. Right. For any listeners who are just joining in, we're talking with Martin Holbert. Uh, we are talking about one of the big statements that you made uh, was emotions can be hazardous to your wealth. Uh, we talked about we're talking about how the brain works, with the emotional side, the logical side, uh, and, and then I, I we put a pin right <laughs> uh, when we talked mm-hmm. about fear-based decisions and you shared with us um, the example of your client who who uh, who basically pulled all his money out at the bottom of, uh, in 2009 um, you gave the example if he had stayed in there he would be over 1.2 million uh, if he had not made that change uh, please continue <laughs> 
Okay, that is an awesome summary. Thank you for doing that. Well, that's how our brain operates, right? Now, there are some things outside of our brains that actually make the problem worse. So I've got good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is if you're guilty of financial misbehavior, you know, it's not your fault because all these outside forces. Um, but the bad news is you're still responsible. Hey, Chris, have you ever felt like your brain was tired? You just couldn't make another decision. Oh, yeah. End of the week, Friday night. <laughs> it's about time yeah. to shut it down. It, it will check out before I do. <laughs> it, it will check out. You know, if you got young kids at home on a Saturday morning, by 9.30 a.m., you're, you're brain dead, right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so we all suffer for basically information overload. We are literally being asked to make more decisions than ever before in the history of mankind. You know, back in the days when I was growing up, you had either a black phone or a yellow phone with a cord. That was it. There was, you want to get jeans, you bought jeans. You want to buy jeans today? How many kinds of Levi jeans are there? I've lost count. The 501s, the 503s, <laughs> the, uh, my, my favorite is the 513s. Uh, you have boot cut, you got straight cut, you got flared cut. And, you know, I, I just want to buy some jeans. And so our brains are not designed to handle this onslaught of choices. There's a, a good book out there called The Paradox of Choice, which just describes this phenomenon. He said these choices are designed to make our lives better, but they're actually making our lives worse with information overload. Now, my TEDx talk, you might remember this. I give an example of fish crackers. Fish crackers is a very simple choice. At least it would appear to be so. Right now I'm in Las Vegas with my wife and my granddaughter, who's two years old. Why do people buy fish crackers? It's to make your kids behave in public. That's the primary reason, right, for fish crackers. <laughs> so if, if we're going off to some important wedding or event, we got the kids or grandkids in tow, we stop by the store to buy some fish crackers to make them happy, and there are now 36 different kinds of fish crackers. 36. And all you want the kids to do is not embarrass you. I was teaching this uh, class about a year or two ago to a company, and a lady yelled out, Vanilla Cupcake. I thought she was calling me Vanilla Cupcake because I happen to be white. I mean, born in Scotland. You don't get much whiter than that. <laughs> but luckily, Chris, she clarified it, and she said, Martin, that is my kid's favorite kind of fish cracker. Did you know, Chris, that there is a Vanilla Cupcake variety of fish cracker? I had no idea. Yeah. When my kids grew up, all we had was cheddar cheese. It was it, and it worked just fine. So all these choices being thrust upon us come at a real cost. In his book, The Organized Brain, Daniel uh, Levitin said, neurons are living organisms that require oxygen and glucose to survive, and when they're being overworked, we experience fatigue. There you go. Our brains literally get tired from too many choices. And he went on to say that every tweet you respond to, every text message, every Facebook status update is competing in your mind for resources with important things like what to do with your money. And the brain can't distinguish if this is important or not. It just tries to process it all until it gets tired, then the brain checks out. And then that's when emotions can take over. But now, yeah, put this you know, brain overwhelming thing in the context of managing your money. If you go to Google right now and you type in how to invest, you'll find 267 million websites on how to invest your money. What good is that? And then we got, you know, the mainstream media with the daily newspapers and the magazines and 24-hour news channels. It's nearly impossible. So if you have a very important financial decision to make and you go off by yourself to do all the research, you get this conflicting, overwhelming information that's uncomfortable, maybe even painful. So emotions kick in and say, you know what, let's just make the quickest choice possible and get rid of this pain. And that's the key point. It's not making the best choice, but the fastest, easiest choice. Now, Chris, there is no cure for financial misbehavior. It is part of being human. In the TEDx talk, I give five kind of bullet points, things you can do, uh, just quick little summaries. What I'd like to do today, and I guess we have about six minutes left, That's I right. want to take a higher strategic level overview of how we can handle financial misbehavior. Is that all right? Yeah, no, that would be fine. You, you, you set us up. I'm looking for solutions now. So. Yeah, solutions, okay. So you got some in the TEDx talk, but these are not in the TEDx talk. I'll break it down to three parts. The first part is I call know thyself. Now, I think that was Socrates that said that, but know thyself. And I break that down to two parts. The first part is define your values, what's important to you. In other words, really financial success, 
in my book, in my mind, it's not about money, but it's about influencing and controlling the impact that money has on the people and the causes you care about most. There's an example. If someone, you know, takes their, say, himself, his wife, his kids, and maybe his grandkids, you know, takes, we'll call it 20 people on a cruise. That's kind of pricey. He might spend $50,000 to do that. Well, is that person's goal to spend $50,000 and give that money to the cruise ship? No. Is his goal to have $50,000? No. His goal is to create long-term family memories, is to increase and tighten family bonds. And that's what that person wants, right? right? So it's not about the 50000 or the cruise ship. It's about the family experience. So know thyself is define clearly what you want your money to do for you and the people and causes you care about most. The second part to know thyself, and that is understand your money personality. Are you a saver, a spender, a risk taker? On my website, ifmoneycouldtalk.com, there's a free money personality. And your money personality is the lens through which you view your financial world. It impacts how you do basically everything, uh, financially speaking. And so understand that, and if you're married, understand that of your spouse, and you'll have fewer disagreements about money. So the first step is to know thyself. The second step is to create a plan. And to make your plan truly effective, I think a couple things need to happen. Make sure you set goals that are in alignment with your values. And you'll be far more committed to the plan. You'll be far more likely to follow through and actually accomplish it. That's why, number one, you know yourself, right? Here's what's important to me. Now we set goals in alignment with what's important to me. And those goals will become much more real to you. Another key part of creating your plan is to get an accurate and honest snapshot of where you are right now. In other words, no, here's exactly how much debt I have. If it's ugly, get it out there. And I think you've probably met clients like this, Chris, and I have as well, who have Let's just call it too much debt, right, credit card debt. Right. It could be very, very liberating to actually get that number on paper or an Excel spreadsheet. Here's exactly where I stand, and here's exactly when I'll be debt-free, whether it's in two years, five years, or whatever. So have an accurate snapshot of exactly where you are. Of course, also in terms of your assets and your pension. I did a plan for a school teacher one time, and I asked her how much was in her 401K. She said, Martin, I, I don't contribute to the 401K. I said, well, the school does for you in any way. So I don't, I don't think so, Martin. So I had her call her school district. Turns out she had $36,000 that she didn't know she had. Nice. <laughs> so so yeah, that, was, that, was, that was a nice, <laughs> nice call to make, right? <laughs> but, so, but so we just don't know sometimes. So get the accurate snapshot. Now, here's a key thing. Uh, HBSC Bank did a study of people who had plans versus those who didn't have plans. The planners won in three key categories. They asked them, how, what do you associate with retirement? The planner said, hope, excitement, and peace of mind. And the non-planners also went in three categories, loneliness, financial hardship, and uh, fear. Wow. So having a plan and then referring back to the often is awesome. And that study went on to say that all else being equal, people with plans who referred back to them often had a net worth 552% higher. So the first part is know thyself, right? What's money going to do for you and your money personality? The second step is create the plan, goals in alignment with your values, accurate snapshots. And if you do those things, you'll probably be happier and, and have more money in the end. And then the last thing, last step I call TAR, that's the acronym, T-A-R. You track your progress. I've got, you know, clients who are, I would call, you know, pretty successful with money. And one thing I've noticed amongst all of them is they track their money. They know where it's going. Do you think that multimillionaires get millions of dollars and then say, you know what, I should probably start tracking this? Or do they track first and that's why they have millions? The second, definitely. <laughs> yeah, the, the tracking comes first. So, okay, you, you've got the plan in line with your values. Now track your progress and your progress will accelerate. That's the key. The A is adjust. The best plans I make for my clients are outdated the moment I give it to them because everything's already changed, right? You know, the stock market, the investments, uh, the the taxes and things like that. So you need to always be adjusting your plan. And then the R in TAR stands for repeat. So you track, adjust, and repeat. If people will do those things, Chris, their lives will be far better. They'll have far less financial stress in their lives. I love so again, it. you know, know yourself, create the plan, and you track, adjust, and repeat. That's the key to overcoming financial misbehavior. 
I love it. And we are right here at the end of this show. We've- Thanks for listening to today's episode of Money Matters Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, visit us on the web at www.moneymatterspodcast.com. Drop us a line on SpeakPipe on the right-hand corner. Uh, It will receive any voicemails, questions, thoughts, concerns that you have about the show. In addition to this, we recently launched a Patreon campaign. Click on the Donate Now tab to hit the tip jar and find out what Patreon's campaign is all about.